Compared to endocrine, look at how little is on this sheet. There's one half. There's the other half. That is it. And that's basically what we're going to do. Okay. So this is, this is so much less. But once again, I may have hinted this to you the other day. Lots of numbers. There are more numbers in this lab than any other lab that we do. And, and the numbers are fair game for the test. You're going to have a, quite a few of the numbers show up on the test. So make sure that you take time to practice writing those numbers. And that will make more sense after we go through this. With this, with teaching this information, I actually like to show you a couple of pictures from the blood lecture just to help you. And here's one of them. And if you want, you can take a picture of these pictures when we talk about them. Um, but you don't have to because these pictures won't be on the test. Okay. So these lecture pictures won't be on the test, but the way that I use the information will be. So if you want to take the picture, that's, that's totally cool. Later, we'll do some pictures and I'll, I'll show you that, that part that will be there. So the first thing, and you can see this on your handout, is that your blood is divided into two major parts, just like your handout is divided. Your blood is divided into the plasma, which is your liquid component. And then the other side of our handout has our blood cells, or what we call the formed elements. And they get all fancy. Instead of just calling them the blood cells, they call them the formed elements. I'll talk about why in just a little bit. Okay. This is a pretty good visual because if you, if you took some blood out and you put that blood in a test tube, and then you put the test tube in this machine called a centrifuge and you spun it around a centrifuge. The red blood cells would go to the bottom because they have a lot of stuff in them and they're small. And they would go to the bottom and your plasma, your liquid would float on top of that. So this is a pretty good representation to show you that it's really close between the amount of liquid in the blood and the amount of cells in the blood. And the real interesting thing that I see on this and I like to point out is right here. All of the white blood cells that you have and all of the platelets that you have would fit in that little space right there that they're calling the bucket coat. So just from this, I think you should be able to tell just from this, which of your blood cells do you have the most of? What color is this? Red. And you may remember that word right there means red blood cell. So you have far more red blood cells than you have the other kinds of blood cells. Okay. Because they would take up this much space and the white cells and platelets would only take up that much. All right. So that helps you just to give you the concept before we even get to the numbers that I'll be talking about. And I walk around, you should all see this at your area. I walked around on break and put it there for you. If anybody didn't get it, needs it, just let me know. Okay. With, uh, back to um, our handout. I might come back to this, but I might not. Let's go back to our little handout. Of that plasma, of the 55% of the plasma, most of it is water. About 90% of it is water. Okay. Please note, not 90% of your blood, 90% of your plasma is water. That's different. Okay. 90% of your plasma is water. And then the other 10% of the plasma, 8% are proteins. And it's kind of funny. The proteins in the plasma, they are truly called plasma proteins because they're the protein in the plasma. Now, the lecture videos over blood will walk you through the different types of plasma proteins. There are three kinds. They each have a different function. That's lecture. I don't touch that at all in lab. So for us right now, you should be familiar with plasma is a little over half of your blood, about 55%. Very common lab test question, by the way. Okay. What percent of your blood is plasma? And the answer is 55. How much of that plasma is water? 90. How much of it is protein? 
eight, and then 2% of it is other stuff, other dissolved particles. And as we just learned, dissolved particles can be called solids. Okay. There are five categories, and this, this is kind of kind of crazy. We're talking about 2% of the plasma right now, just 2%. That's not much, 2% of the plasma. But 2% of the plasma contains these five groups that are so important to life, okay? Yes, you have a ton of water in your blood. That can vary greatly. Yes, you have 8% of your blood is protein. But boy, these things right here, all of your hormones that are traveling through the blood fit in that little 2% group. All of your hormones. Any enzymes that are in the blood fit in that little 2% group. How important is A and H? Well, it regulates your blood pressure. Is your blood pressure important? Yeah. How about aldosterone? Regulates your blood pressure. Is that important? Yeah. Um, how about insulin? Regulates your blood sugar. It's important. Calcitonin and parathyroid, they regulate calcium. Important. So growth hormone, important. Oxytocin, important. Oxytocin, by the way, does more than childbirth and breastfeeding. That's all we got to talk about today. So hormones are vital for life. Uh, many of your hormones, if you don't have the hormone at all, you may not be able to survive that important. That's how your glands are that important. But the amount of the hormone that's in the blood fits in the little category called 2% of the plasma, the other dissolved substances. Can you guys um, name a gas that travels through the blood? Here you go. Oxygen. What's the other major one? Isn't there nitrogen in your blood? There is. We just don't use the nitrogen. Actually, most of the air is nitrogen. So most of what you breathe in is nitrogen. It just goes in okay. and we don't we don't deal with it. Um, so maybe I shouldn't even say in no, the blood because it gets pressurized if you scuba dive or yeah, yeah. pressure yeah, that's and that's where it becomes important. So it's in the air, but not necessarily there. <laughs> Waste product. We're not going to do much with this. So I'm going through this in an order on purpose. But there's one waste that I want to get in your mind now, because we'll talk about it later when we get to the urinary system. And one of the major wastes in urine is called urea. Urea. And it comes from the breakdown of nutrients in your body. One of the byproducts is urea, and we need to get rid of that urea. So there are waste products like urea. There are gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide. All of our hormones, we know, travel through the blood. Electrolytes are also called ions. Those are charged particles. Any charged particles are called ions. Can you name some charged particles that we've talked about? There you go. Sodium. The other one that I didn't get to, that I'll get to talk more about, is calcium. Calcium is dissolved. Um, hydrogen ions travel through the blood. Hydrogen ions make something acidic. There's an ion that's a major buffer that we'll talk about a lot later. It's called the bicarbonate ion. Look, notice how I'm putting plus or minus on all these. They're charged particles. They are ions, OK? Many of these are electrolytes, and many of these could also be called, just so you know, if you take them as a supplement, you probably call them the minerals. Magnesium would be one, okay? You, you may have heard the phrase, oh, take your vitamins and your minerals. Vitamins are one category, minerals are different. Minerals are in rocks, and they're in the soil, but when they get into our body, they separate and they get little charges on them. So the last category is right here, nutrients. What do you think we mean by nutrients? 
how do you get nutrients in? You eat. So we're talking about the food. We're talking about the food. When we say nutrients, we mean what's in the food. So here's the major categories I want you to understand. When they say nutrients, they mean carbohydrates, fats. What's the third one? Protein and the vitamins fit here. Okay. You're being generic. The vitamins would fit here. So here's what we're saying. You go, you eat, and you digest your food, and that food gets absorbed into the blood, and now it's in the blood. All of that together is only taking up 2% of the space in the plasma. That's pretty crazy. But it's this 2% that is so important. Because if these are altered, it really significantly impacts our health. So that's where I would get my first picture if I were you. My first real picture right there. For the lab test, I mean, on this side, there's not a ton of information, to be honest, on the plasma side. But you should be able to give an example of an electrolyte or be able to give an example of a nutrient, say a carbohydrate, right? Or give an example of a waste, urea, or a gas, oxygen, if you're asked. And understand that all five of these categories together only equal what percent of the plasma? Two percent, two percent. That's what's so crazy. Sodium, all, all of these things up high, up here, and over here. Sodium is your best example for right now from what we've talked about. Okay, so going on to this side over here, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint, the lecture PowerPoint. And I like to do the pictures. Oh, before... Maybe before I do that, let me go show you where this is. So our real pictures of blood on your blank PowerPoint that has all those images, we're at the very end, we have pictures of blood right here. So there is a picture of what blood might look like under a microscope. Okay. And so I'll start by on the blood cells with this picture. Anybody want to take a wild guess? These cells here that appear kind of red, what are they? They are. They are RBCs, red blood cells. And I have the fancy word for you on your handout. In case you didn't learn it in AMP1, red blood cells are called erythrocytes. And I know we did it on day one of our class too, so you've already heard that. Erythro is a prefix that means red. So erythrocytes are the red blood cells. If you look up there, you can see that most of those cells in the blood are red blood cells. In a little bit, I'll explain why some of them look like this, like a donut, and some of them don't, okay? But for right now, well, those are the red blood cells. The little bitty ones like this, and like that, and you see a couple, one here and one there. See a couple over here. That one looks like it's in a cell. It's not. It's just sitting on the outside, just floating around on the outside. One up there. All of these are, yep, those are the platelets. And the fancy name for platelets is thrombocytes, okay? I could ask you on the test, what's the medical term for your RBC? Or what's your medical term for platelets? So make sure you know the fancy name. If I just ask you to name those cells, you're welcome to put red blood cell or platelet. Okay, you don't have to use the fancy term unless I ask for it. 
So that leaves, oh, there's only one kind of blood cell left. Do you know what that is? That is correct. It is the white blood cell. And there it is. Does anything about that look white? No. So it's a trick, okay? It is a trick. White blood cells, if you're looking at living blood under a microscope, they might appear white or clear, but more like, remember when we saw when they centrifuged it down, it made that bumpy coat that was kind of pale. So that's why they named them. White blood cells in the blood look like that because they've all been stained. Okay, they've been stained, so they've taken up a dye, so now they won't look white. So they will never look white, just so you know. If you're looking at a smear, can you see where it looks like? I mean, I've, oh, yeah. Like without being stained. Oh, if they're not stained, I've never looked at one not stained. Okay, yeah. I, cause okay. I've, on smears, I yeah. don't, I've never seen white blood yeah. cells, so I think that's my clear. Oh, as, well, all those, all those, <laughs> okay, so I can yeah, show yeah. you one like that. Yeah. yeah. But all the slides that we ever do in the show. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. like, okay, oh, I if you know. did one. Yeah, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, for sure. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah, no, because they need the dye to, yeah. and that's why. Yeah. Which cell up there looks like there's the least number of them? The white blood cell. So go on your handout and go to white blood cell, and you're not going to see white blood cell. You're going to see leukocyte because. Luke, L-E-U-K, means white. So if you have a white discharge, they're going to say you have leukorrhea. Gross. All right. What does it say the white blood cell count is? Approximately five to 10,000. Every lab book you look at is going to have a little different number. Some book might say six to 11,000. Some might say 4.9. Well, anyway. The point is somewhere around five or 10,000 cells. And what units does it say after that? M M to the third power means this millimeter cubed. My pen right here, the tip of this pen is approximately a millimeter across. That means if we made a little ice cube that was that big in every direction, that would be a millimeter cubed. Here's my question to you. In every drop of blood you have, that's that size, one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter, how many white blood cells should you have in that? Five to 10,000. Okay, circle that number. Most likely you'll get it on the test. Okay, five to 10,000. Make sure you put the unit. Per, that's a slash, mm to the third power, okay? That doesn't mean, that means, by the way, check this out. There, if you can see any light through there, that's the millimeter cube. That means in that much of your blood, you have about, let's say, about 10,000 white blood cells. And in the next little drop beside it that big, you have 10,000 more, and the next one, 10,000 more, and the next one, 10,000 more. See, we as people, we have between most of us four to six liters of blood. And in every millimeter cubed, you will have about 10,000 white blood cells. Okay? Can you go to your red blood cells? Look at, look at how many we're going to have. Holy moly. Go look at the number. Oops, I left the end off. Red blood cells? Wow. Five million. In that same droplet, you're going to have maybe 10,000 white blood cells. So it's not like one drop has red cells and one has Every drop has all the cells. And it will have approximately 5 million red cells, approximately 11. 10, 11,000 white blood cells. Okay, what's your platelet count? Go ahead and look it up. It's 150 to 500,000. So here is how I like to help you remember this. White blood cells 
are in the low digits of the thousands, five to 10,000. Let's just say 10,000. You're welcome to put 10,000 and learn it as that. Okay. So 10,000. The platelets, you would add at least a zero. It would go to the hundreds of thousands. And the low end is about 150,000. And for red blood cells, you have to put another zero at the end, and that makes it millions, and it's about 5 million. So basically, man, that's crazy. Every time you change the cells, you go up by 10 times the number, okay? And really, really white, white to red cells. It's crazy, insane, from potentially from 5,000 white cells to 5 million red cells. That's just crazy. Those numbers show up, especially the white cell number and the red cell number. And the way I would ask that on the test, I would say, what is a normal red blood cell count? Okay, those are called counts. The count, red blood cell count. So if you want, maybe snag that picture that just labels the cells. It's just a good first picture and a good visual. Did you know that for red blood cells are nucleated? Oh, Mammals wow. are the only ones that have any nucleated wow. red blood cells. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. When I took biology, I probably did, but yeah. that was 30 years ago. <laughs> So here's a red cell. If we looked at it from the front, it kind of looks like this. It almost looks like a Cheerio or a little candy, like a lifesaver or something. But notice it has a membrane across the middle. And then they're cutting it to show you from a side view that it's narrower. It's not completely hollow there. So if I went back, just because it's what sometimes I do, and showed you this, this one, it's not empty there, but it's close to empty there. And so that one's just perfectly sitting where, if you have it on a microscope, there's a lot of light shining through it. And wherever the thin part is, if it's perfectly angled, it might look like there's nothing there. But there is something there. There's a membrane there. But the thickness is here. These others, they're either turned or stacked, and that's why they look hollow. Because every red cell has that same shape. And that shape, because this, because this is AMP, it has a fancy name. I have written it for you on your handout. Can anybody find it and tell me what the name of the shape is? Yes. So right here, if that curves inward like that, that's the concave side. And this curves inward like that, so that's concave. So there's two concave, little caves, surfaces. So they call it a biconcave. Yes. A biconcave disc. That is the technical description of the red blood cell shape. It likes to show up on the test. Okay. Yeah, biconcave does make sense. Okay. These cells are small. I don't care that you know those numbers. We have enough numbers. We don't have to know the size. But I will tell you this. Um, what's that? Capillary. Here's that. That's small. Micrometers, that's small. Okay. Red blood cells. When they go through capillaries, most of the time, the cell is about that big compared to the capillary. That's how tiny capillaries are. Capillaries are so small that red blood cells line up in single file rows to go through capillaries. That's how tiny a capillary is. Okay, And red blood cells are super tiny cells for your body. They are very small cells. So why does it have this shape? And this is important to understand. Most cells have a nucleus. 
notice we don't see a nucleus there. So a red blood cell, when it started growing and developing, anybody remember from AMP1 where all your blood cells form? In your bone marrow. In your bone marrow. In your red bone marrow. And when they start forming, they have a nucleus. And at some point in their maturation process, they lose the nucleus. And not only the nucleus, but also, oh, I can't spell it today. Also the organelles. The red blood cell ejects its nucleus and its organelles. So basically, it is just a floating sack of chemicals. And the number one chemical that is in there is called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Yes, it's a chemical, but it's also a protein. You could call it a protein. Does anybody know what hemoglobin does? It carries oxygen. It carries oxygen. So your number one function, your number one function for your red blood cell is your red blood cell carries oxygen. Okay? And it carries that oxygen on the hemoglobin molecules. And that cell is full of hemoglobin. I'm going to show you another picture in a second. I'm going to write a number up here just because it's mind blowing. This is the only number on your sheet that will not be on the test. Did you hear that? You can cross it out if you want, in fact. Under erythrocytes, the 250 million, go ahead and put a line through it. I'm going to put it here for one second. I'll erase it before you get your picture, though. There, your average red blood cell, one little cell that's tiny, invisible to the naked eye. There's about 250 million hemoglobins in there. What? Every red cell has about 250 million. Really, that's low. It's closer to 300 million, if you want to know the truth. But I like this because of the math. How many red blood cells in this much blood in the millimeter cube? Five million. Five million. So in this much blood, you have five million red blood cells, and every single one of those has 250 million hemoglobins. If you don't love math, your brain is exploding right now. Okay? Every one hemoglobin, one hemoglobin molecule, remember there's 250 million of them, can carry four oxygens, O2s. So here's what this means. Remember, I'm giving you extra. This is not math for the test. This is because I want to cramp your brain and blow your mind a little. One red blood cell, one red blood cell that has 250 million hemoglobins. Each of those can carry four oxygens. I don't know how you like math and how you like powers of 10 and 3 and all that, but 250 million times 4, that's how much money you have in your bank account. That's a billion, okay? Anybody got a billion dollars? We might want to know. We might need, you know, to borrow some if you have a billion, okay? Um, Every single red cell you have can carry a billion oxygens. How many red cells do you have? We well, have 5 million in that much blood. If you did the math, you would find out that one out of every three human cells is red blood cells. It's crazily mind blowing. Okay, those extra numbers, I'm not going to ask you that 1 billion, I'm not going to ask you. The 250 million, go ahead and cross your line through it. Like I said, those are just crazy numbers to help you understand. How important is oxygen if a red blood cell can carry a billion of them? It's pretty important. Okay, it's pretty important. Go ahead and get this picture. I think the quality doesn't matter, so I can move the light on for that one. Because it helps you with a couple of 
of good things. You may get asked, why is a red blood cell shaped like a biconcave disc? Tell me, why does it have that shape? Because it did what? It lost its nucleus, right? And its organelles. And now it's just a big old sack. So honestly, you want to know the truth? They call it a red blood cell. It's not really truly a cell anymore. It's just a floating chemical sack. And we still say they're alive, but it's just a floating sack. If it gets damaged, it can't fix itself because its DNA is gone. Its organelles are gone. It can't repair. It's just floating around, hoping it doesn't get damaged, carrying its oxygen and doing a couple other little things. But with the chemicals that are already in it, it can't recreate anything because it's not truly living. Okay. So there's that, that one. I'm just going to show you a picture of the hemoglobin. I'm not, I repeat, I'm not going to show you these pictures on the test, but it helps the knowledge stick. So there's hemoglobin. I'll make it even a little bigger. This number is on your handout, so I'm going to go ahead and mention it to you or see if you can find it. How many, oh, I already said it. How many oxygens can our hemoglobin carry? So you see this part right here? That little part, there's the chemical structure, which we obviously don't need. But there's four of those on every hemoglobin molecule. And that part, those little fours, they're actually called the heme. And this little part that kind of looks like sausages or ice cream or something, those are called the globin because globin means a globular protein. That's what globin means. So they call this thing hemoglobin because that molecule is called heme. And there's four of those in the hemoglobin, in the protein chain. So they put the two words together and they give it hemoglobin. Anybody know what FE stands for? Iron. Iron. FE stands for iron. It is on the iron where the oxygen gets carried okay so yes hemoglobin carries the oxygen but it carries it on its little iron molecule so why do we mention that because what color do we talk about blood being red right red and blood has molecules in it it's got cells in it, it's got fluid in it, it's got stuff in it, but it's red. Here's why it's red. Because when iron interacts with oxygen, it makes a red color. Just like if you use a shovel and you leave it out and it rains and it gets wet, what can happen to that shovel? It can rust. So honestly, the color of hemoglobin it happens. It's not rust. Please don't call it rust, but it is similar. It's iron and oxygen interacting and producing a red color. Hey, Miss Carly. Huh? Not today. Now they are. Now they are. All right. So snag that as a reminder about where hemoglobin gets its name. Here is a little picture to help remind you that our blood cells come from where? They come from the bone marrow. So this is showing you the process that happens in the bone marrow. Remember what I'm doing here. I'm using the lecture PowerPoint to help little bits of information stick, not everything on there. You absolutely do not need all the names up there, okay? There's a lot of steps in a cell becoming a red blood cell. 
What is this step showing you? Losing its nucleus. Yeah, losing its nucleus, the nucleus ejecting. Notice it's not until way over there that the cell gets its final name or red blood cell. Here's where I want to go with this. In your bone marrow, you have cells that are capable of becoming red cells, white cells, or platelets, the bone cells. And here's the fancy name for those cells. Chemo, I'm going to make it bigger so you can see it. And by the way, heme means blood. Okay. Cyto, y'all remind me what cyte means. Cell. And you guys remember from osteoblasts, what do blasts do? Oh, maybe we don't. Any cell that's called a blast is a builder. It builds something. Blasts build. Okay. So the name, the fancy name, hemocytoblast, literally means blood cell builder. All blood cells, whether they're red, white, or platelets, they all come from hemocytoblasts in the bone marrow. Okay. Just so happens they give hemocytoblasts an easier name. They also call them one of your stem cells. Those are your stem cells. So I suggest you take this picture, really, because lecture is going to go through this, and I'm trying to help you with as many little lecture topics as I can before you get to that this weekend. Okay? All blood cells are produced where? In the bone marrow. Good. In the bone marrow. From cells called stem cells, what's the fancy name of a stem cell? Yeah, hemocytoblasts. It's hard to get everybody to say that together. It's not important enough for me to have us chant that, so we won't. So let's leave this and go to the next topic. Wow, it's way down here. It's really hiding. I don't need you to see those words. Okay. So that's why I'm okay with it being little. One cell there. Lots of pathways. One, two, three, four five cells at the end. Go on your blood lab handout and go to the very bottom half of the page and what you'll notice at the bottom half of the page, that's where we've listed the five types of white blood cells. Okay, so what I'm letting you know now, you only have one kind of red cell, all red cells are the same. They carry hemoglobin and they're packed full of hemoglobin which carries oxygen. White cells, you actually have five different types. They're each a little bit different from one another. We're going to learn about what they do in a little bit. But for right now, can you tell me from what we just did, where are these forming? In the bone marrow, right? They're forming in the bone marrow. And what cell do they all come from? Hemocytoblasts. So this, if you're taking a crazy physiology class, you would have to learn all of these pathways for producing the white blood cells. But for us, this is just a different version of the one we saw for the red blood cell. It's that all blood cells come from those stem cells called hemocytoblasts. And they have different pathways to lead to them. I don't want it zoomed up yet because we haven't even named these cells yet because we're just, just kind of beginning with it. I'll name them later. What's our third type of blood cell? There it is. 
So tell me, what's this cell? Hemocytoblast, where does it live? In the bone marrow. And when it starts to change, it goes through a different series of steps, will eventually lead it to platelets. Here's, here's the key, though. Once a cell changes and starts on its path, that's it. It can't back up and go, oh, wait, I want to go be a white blood cell. Nope. Once it starts out and it starts changing, it can only go that way. It can only go be a platelet. It can only go be a red cell or only go be a white cell. It can't back up. It could get destroyed, but it couldn't change and become something else. Okay. The one thing that I have to add here that I do want you to know that you haven't had to know for the others is this. Because platelets are not actually cells. Look here. See these little pieces that are tearing off? Those are the platelets. The platelets are just a small piece of a larger cell. Okay? And that larger cell, I'm going to write it big because I want to make sure everybody knows it, mega karyo and site. Okay, remind me what site mean? Cell, what's mega mean? You could say ginormous. No, big. It means big. You can't answer. You can't answer. Anybody know what? You can't answer. <laughs> Anybody know what karyo means? Do we have any good biology people that love biology? You may remember from high school that you have eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Karyo simply means the cell has a nucleus. So look what they're telling you. This big cell that makes that the platelets peel off of, it's got a nucleus. So they call it big cell with a nucleus, mega karyocyte. That may show up on your lab or lecture test, okay? It might say, what is the name of the cell that platelets come off of or are created from or something like that, okay? Platelets come from a larger cell called a megakaryocyte. They're not platelets here. This is not a platelet. They are. They are tiny. They are sacs. Remember how we said red blood cells are kind of sacs of chemicals? Red blood cells are a ton bigger, though. Remember our picture? Red blood cells are big. Platelets are tiny. They're just fragments, just little fragments. So here's my question to you. I guess it's not fair because I haven't told you, but I'll ask. Which cells are the only blood cells that can actually be true living cells? White blood cells. Why white blood cells? What do they have? A nucleus. We saw the nucleus, right? Red cells lost their nucleus. Platelets aren't even whole cells. So now you know the secret. On here, why it says formed elements are 45%. Because red blood cells, even though they're called cells, and platelets are not true living cells. The only true living cell is the white blood cell. Okay, They're actually alive. They have a nucleus. And in fact, they crawl through your body. And they choose where they go. They don't just get pushed around. They can get pushed around in fluids, but they can crawl. They can produce their own little arms and legs and walk around. It's really kind of neat. If you want that picture, snag it. So let's make sure we don't have any holes or gaps in our knowledge, okay? Because we do. I didn't say one thing about a platelet. Oh, what's the function of a platelet? What's it do? 
clot. Very good. Clots the blood. Clots the blood. So let's clot the blood. What did red blood cells do? Carried oxygen. And do you know what white blood cells do? They fight infections. Very good, Neo. They fight infections. That's what white blood cells do. Okay. Fight infection. Look here. There's a sneaky little thing right there. Where do white blood cells spend most of their life? Out in your tissues. This is this is really important. Okay. So important that there's a question that loves to show up on your lab test about this. Red cell count. Look how high it is. It's crazy high. We talked about it. It's 5 million per millimeter cubed. But the white blood cell count was only about what? 5 to 10,000 in the same amount of blood. So why is it so low? And when I ask that question on the test, people say all kinds of things. Because red blood cells are about oxygen. Well, red blood cells are about oxygen. But notice this, where do white blood cells live? Tissues are not in your blood. The white blood cells, they live out in your body. There's a lot of white blood cells out in your body fighting for you right now. Most of your white blood cells are not in your blood. They are out in your tissues. So you may want to make a little note of this somewhere. The reason that you have more red cells in your blood is because that's where they live. The red blood cells spend their whole life in the blood. The white blood cells spend almost all of their life in the tissues. Yes, ma'am. So when you're doing that and you're talking about the white blood cell count, then is that the white blood cell count in your actual blood? That's the only place the count is. It's from your blood. They stick your blood. They stick your arm or your leg or your cheek if they want to. And they get your blood out. And they do it that way. Thanks for that softball. All right. Next bit. We're going to use the five pictures at the bottom of this. There's, that's one white blood cell. Here's a different white blood cell. Here's a different white blood cell. You want to tell me? A different white blood cell and yet another white blood cell. Now, I know it went by them fast. And that's okay. There are five different types of white blood cells. What I'm going to help you do now is learn the characteristics of the various white blood cells so that you can identify them on test day. So on the day of the test, when you take your lab test and you, if you get lucky enough to get this picture and I point over here and I say, name this cell, tell me what it is. Red blood cell. Cool. Okay. I'm going to cover that up because it's not, anybody see a platelet anywhere other than that thing I'm covering? And that's over on the side, and it's dark, so I'm not even going to say it definitely is. Probably, you're not even seeing a platelet here. That's kind of crazy. It's just the way they took this sample. This is your white blood cell. On test day, though, you will not get full credit if you tell me that's a white blood cell. Your job is to know which white blood cell it is, okay? Because there are five kinds. We need to differentiate between the five kinds. So let me help you. If you look at that, first off, this part's the nucleus. And I know as you first look at that, you're going to look at that and go, that looks like how many nucleuses to you. It looks like two, but I'm going to tell you the reality. It's one. That's one nucleus with multiple, here's what they call them lobes. So this nucleus is multi-lobed. It's a multi-lobed nucleus. Let me show you where the lobes are. That's one lobe. That's two lobes. By the way, 
it's connected there. There's a low, there's a low, and there's a low. And by the way, it might just be connected there too. It doesn't have to be, but it might be. So I'm not going to ask you to count the lobes on the test, but this is our only, here's the cool thing, it's our only white blood cell that's going to have a whole bunch of lobes. Okay. We might have some that have two, but this is the only one that is truly multi-lobed. Also, look here. That's pretty pale and fairly clear outside of the nucleus. So those are the two characteristics of this cell. On the other ones we see, they either won't be pale or they won't have pale and clear, and they won't be multi-lobed. So we know this one because it's pale and it's multi-lobed. This cell... Let's call it. A neutrophil. A neutrophil. And it's called a neutrophil because it looks neutral. Its cytoplasm is pretty pale. And neutrophils, here's where the math comes back in, all the numbers. For every white blood cell, you need to be familiar with what its percentage is or what its count is. This white blood cell, the neutrophil, is the most common is the most common white blood cell, and it accounts for about 65%. Now there is a range, but I'm just giving you a solid number to make it easier to remember. Approximately 65% of your white blood cells would be this. And neutrophils, all of these white blood cells, they do more than one thing, but we're going to give you one thing to know about them so that hopefully it sticks when you go off into the nursing program or rad tech or wherever you go. And the neutrophil, it's really important thing that it does is it fights infections from bacteria. So we say it fights bacterial infections. So what does that mean? That means if you're sick, and you go to the doctor, and they draw your blood. Sometimes they do, right? When you're sick, they take a blood sample, and they say, oh, we just want to check your blood and see what you have. The reason they do that is they want to know, do you have a bacterial infection? Do you have a viral infection? Or do you have a fungus? Or do you have something else? Maybe a parasite? And depending upon what you have, it can impact your blood cell count in a different way. So if someone has a bacterial infection, we would expect this, the neutrophil count to go up or to be higher, okay? And that's what we want you to know about the neutrophil. When we get to the immune system, we may say other things about the neutrophil, but this is our first run through. So go ahead and get your picture of your neutrophil with those little facts about it. Typically, the way that it goes on test day is you're going to see four or five of these white blood cells, and I'm going to put the picture up there, and I will ask you to tell me something about it. I might tell you, ask you what causes this count to go up. And in this case, you'd say a bacterial infection. I might ask you, what is a normal percentage for this cell? 65%. Or I might just ask you, name this cell. Okay, and keep in mind, for full credit, you need to put neutrophil. If you just put white blood cell, you're not going to get much credit. So that's our neutrophil. The next one's my favorite. It's the first one I showed you. It's that one right there. Tell me about its nucleus. How many lobes do you see? Yeah, you see two. So this one they would describe as, let's use this, bilobed. So it has a bilobed nucleus. What color is it? Yeah, it's red. And I know if you look at that, 
It looks like it's wearing glasses or it has a mask on. Actually, what's that look like? It looks like Deadpool. Oh, or it looks like, what's the other thing it looks like? Spider-Man. Yeah, Spider-Man's making a comeback, y'all, by the way, just so you know. You know. A few years ago, everybody said Deadpool. Now more people are saying Spider-Man. They are. Every year, we go to elementary schools, and we show them stuff from the human body, and we always take this. And usually, a &P, we go into a third grade classroom, and we show them this, and we say, what does that look like? And for the past few years, they all say, Deadpool. They're eight years old, and they know who Deadpool is. But last year, when we went, the whole class was screaming Spider-Man. It was really cool. All right, back to it. So what is this cell called? Here's what it's called. Eosin, Deadpool loves to sin. Eosinophil. It's an eosinophil. By the way, you don't need to know this, but eosin is a dye. It's an acid dye, and acid dyes stain things red. So that's why this cell is red. Remember, in nature, our white blood cells don't have these colors. We stain them. We put different dyes on there and see what uptakes the dye, and then we know which is which from that. Almost always, the bilobed feature makes it look like it's got eyes or something. So back in the day, people also used to say, oh, it looks like an alien. It looks like a little alien that was on the beach and got sunburned. So there he was. He's got a suntan. I, I like giving you memory devices. So this one starts with the E. And what percentage is it? That E is a backward three. Okay. This is 3%. And remember, for each one, if it's relevant, we want to know what might cause its count to go up or what condition it fights. Eosinophils do multiple things, but the one that we give you is eos eosinophils fight parasites. Very good. Notice that site is not meaning cell, okay? It is not spelled the same way. So eosinophils fight parasites. They look red. They're bilobed, and they're approximately 3% of your white blood cell count. That's all you need for that one. I don't do granulo versus agranulo. It's too much for day one. In eight weeks. Yeah. Okay, I know it's blurry, but these are hard to find. Okay. That one is blurry and it's splotchy. And it's dots that you're seeing. They're kind of grape colored, but you know, they're in the blue family. Right? It's you can tell those are dots that are all kind of over the place. In fact, there's so many dots. that you can't really see the nucleus. It has a nucleus. Its nucleus is a lot like the eosinophil. I don't need you to know that because you don't see it. But it's there in the background. But it has these dark blue staining granules. And we almost always see them, OK? Blue dyes. Things that turn things blue are basic. So they chose to call this cell because it stains with blue. Yeah. Basophil. Now, basophils are the least common. In fact, less than 1%. Less than 1% of them will be this. Okay.
this is a different way of thinking of things. Basophils are the cells that actually cause many of your symptoms when you have allergies. Okay, so these get activated with allergies, and those granules hold a chemical called histamine, and they release that histamine, and it causes you furry eyes and red and itchy and all that. It's not the only chemical in the granules. There's other chemicals as well. But this is your basophil. Notice it's the first one that we said actually causes something. When we talked about the others, the way we phrased it was neutrophils fight bacteria. Eosinophils fight parasites. Basophils are fighting grass. Basophils are fighting pollen. Basophils are fighting peanuts. Basophils are fighting something that's not harmful to you that your body, for some reason, thinks is a problem. Okay? So there is the basophil. Go ahead and snag that picture. All right, we only have two more. Hey, count up the percentages that we've done so far. Neutrophil. Neutrophil was what? 65. Eosinophil was three, and this basophil was approximately one. What's 65 plus three plus one? Who cares? Well, I do. That's the year I was born. But anyway, okay. So here's what we're going to do. When we get to the end, after we get to this next one, I'm going to do that with you again because it makes it easy for you to go, oh, did I remember the numbers? If it adds up to 100%, you remember the numbers. Here's the next one. This one is the second most common after the neutrophil. This one's major characteristic is a nice, pretty, big, round nucleus. Okay? This is called a lymphocyte. We have two major types. Hmm, one was on the endocrine system handout already called a T cell. And you may remember we mentioned it matures in the thymus. No big deal. You don't need that. The other type is called a B cell. There's a minor type as well, but we're not going to worry about that for now. So your two most common types of lymphocytes are called T cells and B cells. Here's the crazy thing. When you're looking at them, you can't tell which is which. They just work different, okay? But you can't tell. Lymphocytes, or T cells and B cells, account for about, wow, 25% of your white blood cells. Okay, about 25%. So remember, neutrophils, the multi-lobed ones, were about 65%. Lymphocytes are about 25%. Okay, very important. These are the cells that activate the part of your immune system or work in the part of your immune system that is known as specific immunity. That is the part of your immune system that has a memory. That is the part of your immune system that allows immunizations and vaccinations to work. If you didn't have T cells and B cells, there would be no such thing as a vaccination, okay? Because vaccinations stimulate these cells and do things with these cells. So notice I'm doing this one a little different. I'm not telling you a condition. I'm setting you up to know something about them that we'll talk about when we get to the immune system, okay? How do you identify a lymphocyte? Big, round, nucleus big round nucleus and notice we wouldn't say this is super red or super blue it's just kind of there the out, outer part of the cell so it's nucleus stains real dark and then you just have the rest of the cell there sometimes depending on how much dye they use the whole little cell might look dark but not the ones i'll show you okay 
So there's your lympho site. Go ahead and snag that picture. And now we can do the last one. All right, so now let's go through the percentages again. Neutrophils, what percent? 65. Lymphocytes, what percent? 25. 25. What's 65 and 25? 90. 90. So the other three types are only 10% combined. We knew that E was 3, right? And the basophil was 1. So that's 94. So what does this one have to be? This one's 6%. Approximately. It's not exact. This one has a big nucleus. Look at that. It actually, most of the time, it looks like the nucleus actually busts out of the cell. The reality is the nucleus is big and the membrane, it's still in the membrane. But then the rest of the membrane is kind of right here looking a little smaller. Okay. This happens to be, I know you can't tell from this picture because we don't have other white blood cells on there happens to be the largest white blood cell, okay? That's pretty big compared to those red blood cells there, but it's the largest. And most nucleus presents this shape. Say it's shaped like a horseshoe. Now, sometimes it could be just a large bean-shaped nucleus, but most of the time, well, if I show it to you, I'll show you one that has this traditional horseshoe shape. It is the largest. So they chose to give it, give it that name. They call it a monocyte. Mono just means one. I don't know why they call it a monocyte. Maybe because it's lonely, hanging out by itself. It has one nucleus. One nucleus. Anyway, here's the key for this one. This is the only one that when it goes into the tissues, we're going to give it a new name. When it goes into the tissues, they no longer call it a monocyte. So neutrophils are neutrophils traveling through the blood. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention this to you guys. Your white blood cells are in the blood, right? Because we have every one you're cute. But they're usually just in the blood for the first day after they're formed and they travel through the blood and then they leave the blood and they spend their life where? In the tissues. And really they may not even be in the blood the whole day. They're just traveling through the blood to get out, to go live in the tissues. Neutrophils, when they're in the blood, they're neutrophils. When they're in the tissue, they're neutrophils. Eosinophils are called eosinophils in the blood. And guess what they're called in the tissues? Eosinophils. Yeah. Monocytes. When they leave, they chose to give them a new name. These are your your macrophages. So the cell that's called a macrophage started out its life as a monocyte. It got into the tissues and it eats. <clears throat> and when it eats, it swells up in the tissues. Macrophages, some of them can get up to eight times their normal size. They can just eat and eat and eat. And they're cleaning up garbage and they're doing a lot of other stuff too. So get your picture of the monocyte. This poor class was that we meet twice a week. I'm calling this poor class because we didn't have class the first Monday. So we've had to do everything faster than the normal classes. Yeah. So that's why it feels rushed. Guys, usually when I do this blood lab, it's the blood lab only by itself on a day, you know, and it's much smoother to do. In fact, because I had to do this, I forgot something that I was supposed to do for endocrine that I even told you I was going to do. So right now, we're done with blood. Before I move back to endocrine, do you guys have any questions about the blood? 
almost everything you would be asked here, right? It's on here. And remember, how we're going to do these bottom ones is show you a picture to get you to tell us what cell it is, okay? And also, typically, I'll show you one picture, and I'll ask you to name the cell or ask you another fact about it. You may have two questions about that one, probably just one. Okay, let me stop this. I must go pick up other. 